All right, cool. So as we discussed, uh, we're gonna be talking about a bunch of interesting stuff now related to ChatGPT. Uh, first, we're gonna check out some examples of uh, leading enterprises that have been using it. Uh, and then we're gonna be comparing the different GPT models and really see what sets them apart. Uh, then we're gonna be taking a closer look at the OpenAI API, uh, figuring out how it works and show you how you can, how you can get started today with ChatGPT. Um, then we're going to be exploring a demo of a GPT powered app. Um, and finally, we're going to wrap it up by sharing some insights on where can ChatGPT uh, head next in the future. So before we dive into all of that, let's just take a step backward and explore some key statistics about ChatGPT that I believe you probably haven't heard before, or at least some of them. So ChatGPT's data set contains uh, 570 gigabytes of text data spanning uh, a wide range of topics and domains. Uh, the sheer volume and, and variety of data have equipped the model uh, with, with an, an extensive knowledge base. Uh, it enabled it to generate contextually relevant responses in various contexts and for various industries. So the data set has been curated to include diverse sources uh, such as websites, uh, books, articles, forums from all over the web, uh, ensuring that it has a comprehensive understanding uh, of the human language uh, patterns. And this is one of the very interesting sets. Uh, as, as much as we're impressed with ChatGPT and its capabilities, it only took an estimated of 34 days to train ChatGPT uh, by OpenAI. Uh, which really demonstrates the immense computational power um, and resources invested uh, in creating it, but it also shows the complexity and depth uh, of the model. And ChatGPT is not cheap, at least for running it. Uh, the estimated con monthly cost for running ChatGPT on Microsoft Azure, it's 2.4 uh, million pounds. Uh, so this pretty much underscores the financial commitment uh, by OpenAI uh, and, and their, their um, investment to, to maintain it and to operate it uh, as a large-scale AI model. Uh, it's a lot of money. However, uh, it's not just consuming resources, but it's also generating profit. As at the moment, uh, ChatGPT is generating uh, revenue from multiple streams. And by the end of 2023, OpenAI is expecting ChatGPT to have generated 160 million pounds. Uh, this really highlights the growing demand and the market potential for it. So the revenue streams, as Jacob has highlighted, uh, there's the subscription-based services like ChatGPT Plus. Uh, there's also the API usage fees, which, which we're going to be going uh, over in a bit. Um, and there are also some customized solutions for businesses and industries uh, like customer service, content creation, um, virtual assistants, and more. So companies keep on recognizing uh, the value of ChatGPT. And as more companies uh, recognize the value of it more and more, the revenue potential will continue uh, to rise. And this is a scary number, but uh, if we were to train ChatGPT using a single NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPU, it would have taken approximately 355 years. Imagine. So without harnessing the power of uh, AI uh, and, and the, the power of multiple GPUs working simultaneously together, uh, the development would have probably taken ages. Uh, so it would have made it really impractical uh, to get it done. So this demonstrates the rapid development and advancements on hardware technology and how it fits really nicely with the development and uh, uh, improvement of AI. So, in order to make it happen, in just 34 days, OpenAI employed a massive array um, of 1,023 A100 GPUs. Um, they were all used to train uh, the model. Uh, these high-performing GPUs significantly accelerated the training process, uh, which really allowed the development uh, for, for such a powerful model to happen in a short period of time. So if you think about it, the continuous investment in hardware could be vital uh, for, for uh, the, the uh, AI development and really to push its boundaries in the future. Industry leaders have been implementing AI and ChatGPT into their offerings. Uh, and some of them you can see here on the screen, we've got Snapchat, uh, Slack, Duolingo, Salesforce, and Microsoft. 
So as for Snapchat, uh, they're using ChatGPT now to power their own chatbot, uh, which is called Chatbot, uh, which pretty much it answers questions about Snapchat features. Uh, it provides customer support. Uh, it can even help users create snaps. So for example, if a user asks how to uh, create a geofilter, the chatbot provides a step-by-step -step instructions uh, showing the user how to do that. For Slack, uh, it's using now ChatGPT to uh, power its smart replies feature. So for example, uh, it can generate and suggest relevant responses, uh, which can really save the user's time. So if, if uh, someone is gonna message a user asking for their, for their availability, uh, the smart response can immediately send a message saying, I'm available from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And this depends on the calendar of the user. Um, a lot of channels now have integrated ChatGPT also uh, as a bot to get answers to questions are, that are being asked in the channels, uh, only just to get this immediate response rather than waiting for uh, someone to go and answer. Uh, Duolingo, for those that don't know it, it's an app that help you learn languages. So they're now using uh, ChatGPT uh, to power its conversational AI feature, which is really, really interesting because I'm one of the users of Duolingo. Um, and, and this conversational AI allows users to practice speaking uh, and listening to a foreign language with a chatbot. So imagine you want to learn Spanish. Um, they can, like, you can easily not just learn it from the application, but you can also ask the AI to help you practice the, pronunci the pronunciation of the words um, on, and the letters, which really can help you learn languages uh, in a way, way faster uh, uh, period of time. Salesforce, also for those that don't know it, it's, uh, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest customer relationship management system. Um, it's using ChatGPT now to power something called uh, the Einstein bots. So the Einstein bots, they are AI-powered chatbots um, that can answer customer questions, can resolve issues, and can even go far and close deals. So for example, if, if a customer uh, has a question about their account, uh, they can just simply ask the Einstein bot for help. And of course, Microsoft. Microsoft uh, is one of the backbones for ChatGPT, uh, who have recently invested $10 billion towards its development. Uh, they've been going all in with ChatGPT. Uh, they're, they're using it to power uh, their Power Virtual Agents feature, which is basically AI-powered AI chatbots um, that are used to automate the customer service, sales, and marketing tasks for companies. So as a company, uh, you can now use uh, the, the virtual agents that are powered by ChatGPT uh, to answer questions uh, for your customers um, and answer questions about your products and services, which is really, really interesting, especially uh, in the world of customer service. And also Microsoft, you probably uh, have, have heard before, uh, they've been also using ChatGPT in their Office and Teams programs. So ChatGPT, for instance, uh, can provide real-time translation uh, in, in Teams. For example, we're having this, this call at the moment, if ChatGPT is integrated, or if we're using uh, uh, Microsoft Teams, there'll be instant translation happening uh, in real time. And they've also integrated it uh, in, in Office, uh, like Word and Excel, uh, to suggest, for example, autocorrect uh, uh, suggestions in, in, in Office uh, programs overall. So these are just really a few examples of how ChatGPT is revolutionizing uh, different industries and how it's being used by leading businesses to improve uh, the products and services. And mainly, uh, they are using it either to improve their current offerings or just to better the user experiences uh, uh, for their customers and their clients while they're using uh, their, their platforms, apps, and, and, and products overall. So OpenAI has developed several models, right? Uh, when we talk about ChatGPT, most people think it's only one model or it's only one model that you're interacting with online. However, there are multiple models uh, that have been developed to achieve the different sophistication and langu language capabilities needed for the different industries and for the diverse use cases. Um, so we've got the GPT-3. Uh, also, many people don't know what it stands for. GPT is, uh, is, stands for the Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Um, so GPT-3 basically was one of the most significant breakthroughs when it was first released uh, in 2020, uh, and such capabilities were really unheard of at that time. Uh, it has a massive 175 billion parameters. It's capable of understanding and generating human-like responses across various topics and contexts. 
um, and it has been used in so many applications for language translation, um, question answering, uh, content creation, and so more. Uh, then the second generation of GPT-3, uh, GPT-3.5, which is an upgraded version of GPT-3. Uh, it even has more extensive parameter count of over 300 billion. Uh, it was trained on a blend of text and code, um, and it was published just before the end of 2021. Uh, that's why the training has stopped at that point, uh, meaning it cannot access the internet or more recent data or events at the time being. Uh, but it has more advanced capabilities than GPT-3, uh, enabling it to generate more human-like uh, uh, responses that are contextual and depending uh, on the conversation that the user is having with the, with the bot. And of course, GPT-4, the next generation of, of GPT-3, uh, is the newest, the most powerful, and it is multimodal. And by multimodal, this means that it can accept both text and image as inputs. Um, so it was released in March 2023, just last month, um, and it's the most capable um, amongst all of the other models, GPT-3.5 and GPT-3. Uh, and this really means that you can use GPT-4 um, in, in so many different ways. For example, you can upload a worksheet um, and it will be able to scan it, output all of the questions and responses to these questions. Or you can uh, have it read a graph that you upload and it can make calculations based on the data presented in the graph. So it is currently under development and it is only available for plus users, those who are paying for, for ChatGPT, um, but it has higher capabilities in understanding and generating code, um, even translating languages in, in real time or uh, writing different kind of creative content for various industries. So it's really, really, really impressive. Um, and last but not least, there is DALI. Uh, you probably have heard of this before, uh, but it's a generative AI model that can generate images uh, and art uh, pretty much from just a text prompt. So you can just write a sentence describing exactly what you want to see, and DALI can create an image for you in just a matter of seconds. Uh, it was first released in uh, January 2021, uh, but since then, it has been upgraded significantly uh, in a second version that's called DALI 2. Uh, you only need to write a couple of words, uh, describe what you're looking for, and it can really generate a very beautiful art, which has been attracting a lot of non-artists who find it really interesting to, to deal with it. So all of these models, they're called uh, large language models, LLMs, which, which is a type of artificial intelligence that are trained uh, uh, on a massive data set of text and code. So LLMs pretty much uh, are different because they can learn the, the, the statistical relationships between words um, and phrases, which allows them to generate text that is both coherent, but also grammatically correct. So all of these models, it's worth mentioning that they have sub-models. Uh, so they vary in different sizes and capabilities. So to explore them really quick, um, and this is quite interesting because if you'd like to have uh, the, the, the model uh, do a certain thing for you, you might want to choose uh, one of the subset models rather than uh, another model that won't be as relevant for your use case. So basically, we have GPT-3 ADA, which is uh, the smallest and least computationally um, expensive GPT-3 model. Uh, it possesses only 2.7 billion parameters. I only say only because Compared to the other models, uh, it's, it's really small, but it's still a lot uh, compared to, to, to uh, other models before uh, GPT. Uh, it makes it ideal for projects with limited resources or computational power. Um, despite its smaller size, it can really deliver uh, uh, impressive per uh, performance across a variety of, of natural language pro uh, processing tasks. Um, then we've got Babbage. Babbage basically is a larger and more powerful model uh, that's compared to ADA. Um, it has multiple strengths such as moderate classification, uh, semantic search, and more. Uh, it requires more computational resources, uh, but it has strengths uh, in so many different uh, ways. And then we have Curry, uh, which is even a larger model than Babbage. Uh, it, it possesses uh, 13 billion parameters, and it off, uh, offers significant uh, improvements in language generation, and it understands tasks and it can do stuff like language translation, complex classification, summarization, and more. And last but not least, uh, DaVinci is the largest and most powerful model in the GPT-3 series. Uh, it has 175 billion parameters. So it's, it's a really huge model and it delivers the best performance out of the four uh, in a wide range of, of different tasks, to be honest. Uh, and once you use it, you'll be able to sense the difference 
in the outputs between all of these models. So each of these GPT-3 models, uh, they have their, their strengths and weaknesses uh, with trade-offs between computational uh, requirements and performance. So when you're choosing the right model for you, you should really consider the available resources uh, and the desire of the level of, of performance. And then we have the GPT-3.5 models. Um, da Vinci 003 is the most recent and most advanced in the GPT-3.5 uh, family. Uh, so we had uh, 001 and 002 in GPT-3. This is the most advanced um, amongst all of them. It allows you to perform language tasks with better quality and even longer output. Um, and even consistent instruction following, which is quite important with so many tasks. Uh, there is Da Vinci 002, similar to uh, 003, but instead it's been uh, uh, trained with supervised fine tuning instead of reinforcement learning. And of course it's better than the 001 version. And Code Da Vinci uh, is pretty much designed for code generation. So it's for us developers, uh, it's trained for uh, um, uh, development tasks, for coding tasks um, on a massive data set of text and code. It, it has multiple use cases, uh, pretty much from translating code from one language to another, which was like almost impossible to automate a couple of years ago. Um, automating tasks, generating documentation and all of that. And last but not least, we have the GPT 3.5 Turbo, which is pretty much similar to the DaVinci 03, but it's faster um, and it's trained on a large data set and it's optimized for chat and at, and at only one tenth of the cost of text DaVinci 03. So you can see the huge difference between uh, each of the models. And uh, last but not least, as of uh, for GPT-4 models, we've got GPT-4 8K. Uh, it's more capable than any of the uh, GPT-3.5 and GPT-3 models. Uh, it's able to do more complex tasks and it's optimized for chat. Um, and we've got the GPT-4 32K. Uh, it has pretty much the same capabilities as the 8K. Uh, but with 4x the context length pretty much. So 8k has uh, 8,000 parameters and 32k has 32,000 uh, parameters. And this means uh, pretty much uh, uh, that the 32k has four times as many parameters. So parameters they mean uh, um, or they refer to as variables that are used to learn the statistical relationships between words and phrases. So the more parameters a model has, uh, the more complex relationships it can learn. So you can see now how uh, powerful this model is compared to the previous models that we, we just described. So this shows um, the, the difference between the, the models quite clearly, uh, to be honest. Uh, so the 8K has, has a context length of 8,182 tokens, uh, while the 32K has a, a context length of 32,768 tokens. Um, and if you're wondering what a token is, uh, it's, it's basically a unit of text uh, in, in, in AI that is used to represent a word, a phrase, or a punctuation mark. So the context length pretty much is the maximum number of tokens that the model can process at once. Uh, so this means that GPT-4 32K can process four times as much text as GPT-4 8K um, at a time. So this makes it better suited for so many tasks that require the model to process large amounts of data and text, such as machine translation and text summarization. But to be honest, for many basic tasks, the difference between GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 is really not significant. Um, however, like for, for complex reasoning situations, uh, GPT 4 is much, much more capable than any of the other previous models. Um, and the biggest difference that GPT 4 is a multi-model, as I just said. Uh, it accepts both text and images as input types, while GPT-3 is only limited to text. So while you cannot input images uh, using ChatGPT's user interface at the moment, using the API, which I'll be going over shortly in a bit, um, you, can, you can use it to, to input images and receive natural language uh, code, instructions, and artificial opinions. Uh, as a response. So this means that you, you can, for instance, uh, input an image alongside a set of clear instructions or a question or opinions, and GPT-4 can return the data uh, um, well, as a structured answer that has a set of both um, the data and the, the input that you associated the image with. So for example, you can uh, enter an image of a pattern uh, of shapes and ask GPT-4 to complete the, the 
the pattern. Uh, maybe that's not the best use case for GPT-4, but a better example could be um, you importing a set of graphs or data, and you can use GPT-4 to extrapolate advanced business strategies based on this information. So companies that specialize in computational uh, intelligence will be benefiting from this the most. Here we have a very interesting example, um, which is GPT-4 uh, is being used to, to um, pretty much process a Reddit post. Um, and it's, it doesn't even explain it, but it also explains what's funny about it. So being able to process the image, and especially here you have like different images within one image, and it can determine that there are multiple panels and explain each one of them. And not just that, but also determine what's funny about it. It's really interesting display of how uh, GPT-4 has come so far and the current advancements in this technology. One of the early adopters of GPT-4, uh, this is a very interesting use case. Uh, if, if you don't know uh, the, the company or the application, Be My Eyes. So Be My Eyes was founded in 2015 uh, to connect users who are blind who, or have low vision uh, uh, to sighted volunteers pretty much. So they have like, this application, uh, individuals can pretty much request to be connected with a sighted volunteer and then you're connected with them and then you can just show them what you're trying to 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 to, to uh, uh, locate or if there's something that you would like to identify and the sighted volunteer would be able to help however uh, they wanted to revolutionize the way they delivered the service so it's one of the early adopters of, G of gpt4 and they introduced this virtual volunteer feature now which is the very first uh, digital virtual assistant powered by OpenAI's uh, GPT-4 model, as I said. So this revolutionary uh, uh, step, pretty much, it trans is transforming at the moment the lives of people with visual impairments or blindness. It's equipping them with this powerful technology um, and way to automate uh, uh, this process um, of the application so they can navigate their surroundings, they can tackle daily challenges, they can even achieve a greater autonomy. So through the app, individuals can easily send images um, and the virtual volunteer will swiftly respond uh, to queries about the image uh, and, and furnishes real-time visual support for different uh, array of tasks pretty much. So this really stands out and it goes beyond just identification. For instance, a user can submit an image of their fridge uh, interior and the app can not only uh, discern its contents, but can also uh, help the user prepare food with these ingredients. So this tool can then offer a variety of recipes uh, using the ingredients that it, it identified in the fridge. Uh, and it can even send step-by-step uh, -step guides on how to make them, which is quite revolutionary, to be honest. So now, since you know, understand the different GPT models, let's explore the OpenAI API, which I believe will be the most interesting uh, to you here, um, because you can easily and get started with, with, with ChatGPT's API um, and build your own applications uh, that are GPT powered. So the OpenAI API pretty much, it provides you with this interface to interact with uh, GPT models, right? Uh, when making a request to the API, you need to provide a request body with specific parameters that define the behavior uh, requirements uh, of, the, of the AI generated output. So the very first thing that you have to provide in your uh, request body is the model, obviously. You have to specify which model you want to process that request through. So in this case, uh, I'm selecting text DaVinci 03 because it's one of the most powerful, but you can replace it with the code of the model that you'd like to use chat, uh, uh, that you'd like to, to your application to use to, to process uh, the requests. Um, of course, then you need to add the prompt. So this is pretty much your input text or the question that you'd like the GPT model to respond to. Uh, it serves as a starting point uh, and pretty much it's what you input in the chat GPT interface when you're interacting with it. And then we have the temperature. And this is my favorite because this parameter uh, influences the randomness and the creativity of the AI generated text. So higher values, and it goes between zero and one. So a higher value like 0 0.9 or one um, it can really result in a more diverse and creative outputs. While lower values like 0 0.1 will make the output more focused and deterministic, if you want to say. Um, so you can adjust the parameter based on the desired level of creativity uh, of your application, and it, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve uh, with, with your output. So let's say that you ask the AI to generate a sentence that starts with, the mysterious creature in the forest was, ah, 
with a high temperature, which is the peak, 100, um, the mysterious creature in the forest was a, uh, it was filled with very random, uh, unexpected answer, a neon spotted giraffe with the wings of shimmering silk. Like who would have expected such a response? Uh, but with a low temperature, it will only stick with something that's common, something that's not too creative. Uh, for example, in this case, a large wolf. So you can see the, the difference outputs based on the temperature and, and um, how it really uh, differentiates the outputs from each other based on what you're trying to achieve. Of course, you've got also the max tokens. Um, so this parameter specifies is the number of the uh, tokens, which means uh, the number of the words or, or the word pieces. So uh, the AI will know exactly how long you're expecting the response to be, which really helps you to control the length of the output, ensuring that it doesn't become too lengthy. And there's something called the top P. Uh, uh, this parameter, also known as the nucleus sampling, uh, it really filters the generated tokens based on their probability. So it helps control the randomness and the quality of the output. A value one includes all possible tokens, um, while lower values like uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 will restrict the generated tokens uh, to a smaller, more probable subset. Uh, so adjusting this parameter can really help find the balance between creativity and consistency uh, in the output. So imagine you have like uh, this program and you want to ask it to generate uh, ice cream flavors. Uh, with higher top P, like 0 0.95, like the AI can suggest flavors like uh, avocado lime or lavender honey or, or whatever, something like that's, that's unique. But with uh, lower top P, it will stick to more common and popular ones like vanilla or chocolate. So you can adjust it based on how diverse and how creative you want it uh, to be. But it's worth mentioning that it's for better quality and reasonable responses, it's not recommended to change the temperature and the top P uh, at the same time. And we have also the frequency penalty. So this parameter allows you to control the frequency of the generated tokens. Uh, it takes values between minus two and two. Uh, a positive value will, will make the model less likely to choose uh, high frequency tokens or words, uh, resulting in more diverse outputs. Um, a negative value will make the model uh, favor high frequency tokens, producing more common and expected uh, responses. So for example, if you wanna ask the, the uh, AI to generate a, a list of diverse vocabulary within a story, uh, negative frequency penalty, uh, it will lean towards more common words. And of course, uh, with, with a positive frequency penalty, it will look for, for those that um, are unique and less predictable. And last but not least, we have the presence penalty. And this parameter controls uh, uh, the, the penalty applied to tokens or words that have already appeared in the in the generated text. So it ranges from minus two to two, and a positive value discourages uh, the model from representing uh, or repeating pretty much tokens or phrases, uh, leading to more diverse outputs, uh, while a negative value makes it uh, more likely to repeat tokens or words, which can be useful if you want to petition uh, to, to, to be uh, in the output. So let's say if you want the AI model to generate a list of activities you can do in the weekend, uh, with a positive presence penalty, it will try to avoid repeating the same activities, uh, while with a negative presence penalty, it will repeat certain activities which could be useful if you want to emphasize on the importance of specific tasks or suggestions. So now, since you're aware of the different available parameters, which are the stepping stone to using the API, uh, let me show you exactly how you can get started with a very simple uh, Java application that I quickly built, uh, which uses chat uh, GPT or uses GPT pretty much uh, to power and accept responses and sends um, uh, a reply back. So to begin, you need to sign up for OpenAI account um, and you need to obtain your unique API key. So this key is essential for authenticating your application with the OpenAI API and accessing the services. So it's pretty much as a secret key uh, that you generate and you can add a name to it, for example, so you can know which APIs are active and which were uh, lastly used. And once you generate the API or the secret key, make sure to copy it and store it somewhere safe because you won't be able to view it again afterwards. And regarding the pricing, OpenAI uses a model-based pricing structure. So this means that the cost of using the API depends on the uh, 
uh, specific language model that we're using. So the prices for, uh, for, for the models, they're pair 1,000 tokens. And you can think again of tokens as pieces of words where 1,000 tokens is, is approximately around 750 words in a paragraph. So for GPT-4, uh, it has two pricing. It has a prompt and a completion uh, uh, price. So the prompt price pretty much, it refers to the cost uh, of generating a prompt or input, or input text for the model. For example, if you want to gen, uh, generate a paragraph of text based on a given topic, the cost of generating that topic or prompt would be the uh, prompt price. The completion price, on the other hand, it really refers to um, the cost of generating the completed text and response from the model based on the input prompt. So in the completion price, uh, the, it would really correspond to the cost of generating the actual paragraph of text based on the prompt and not analyzing the prompt itself. So for GPT 3.5, it only has one standard price, which is for usage. Um, and to consume $1 using ChatGPT 3.5 uh, Turbo model, you will need to process around 500K tokens. So, which is quite a lot and which makes it really affordable for developers to get started uh, and test out their applications uh, with, with this model without really worrying about spending much. And for the GPT older models, they're even cheaper, uh, providing you with additional affordable models that you can experiment with. Uh, DaVinci is the most uh, expensive amongst them here and Ada is the cheapest. So to demonstrate how you can build a, a GPT powered app uh, that sends a request to a GPT-3 model, and receives a response. Um, I needed a framework that is quick to get started with, right? And for, for the pur purposes of this presentation, uh, Sprint Boot has enabled me to rapidly develop this chat GPT powered app and focus on showcasing its functionality and integration with OpenAI API. So I'm sure if most of you uh, are aware of the Spring Boot um, framework, but for those of you that aren't, it's pretty much a powerful Java framework that allows you to quickly uh, set up basic uh, application structure, handle web requests, um, and even integrate with other tools and services. So it provides a number of pre-built components and libraries, uh, which can really help speed up development and reduce uh, the amount of boilerplate code that need to be written. So for the main project files, uh, we had the pom.xml, which is the project uh, object model file, which is used to uh, manage the, the dependencies, the plugins, the configurations. Uh, it sets up the Spring Boot application with the necessary dependencies, uh, which pretty much are needed to communicate with the ChatGPT API. Um, and the, since there were no dependencies related to OpenAI, uh, we were uh, using the, the HTTP um, for, for communication. Um, then I set up an index.html page, which pretty much has a form uh, that allows users to submit their queries just when you're using ChatGPT um, using the HTTP POST method. So when a user submits their query, uh, the data is sent to the server side component for processing, uh, which, which then communicates with the GPT uh, API to get a response. And of course, I had to start it with some CSS to, to pretty much make it more visually appealing uh, for the user and more polished. And last but not least, that's the core, the core part of the app, um, which is pretty much a GPT controller Java file. So this is a class file uh, that acts as a service side controller in the Spring Boot application. Uh, it handles the communication between the user interface, the, the index.html file, and the GPT uh, API. Um, it basically is responsible for managing the flow um, within, within the application and uh, Within the data, it processes the, the user input and it returns the generated responses um, as a result. So just to explain it really quickly and then show you this app live in, in, in action um, and to break it down, of course, I started with imports. So I'm not gonna be going through all of them, but you can see here that we have uh, the URI, which um, is used to create a URI for the open AI API endpo endpoint. Uh, the map, which is used to create the request body, which we're going to be uh, showing you now. Uh, then the HTTP client and the HTTP request, which are uh, used to create uh, the request to the OpenAI endpoint and then uh, receive uh, the, the, the response. 
um, and then the, uh, of course, HTTP response as well, which are all needed to manage the communication between the API and the interface. And of course, the uh, different sprint, uh, sprint framework classes that are responsible in handling and mapping the HTTP post and get requests from and to the open AI API. Um, again, I won't be going through, through all of them, but it's worth highlighting this one uh, um, uh, import, which, which pretty much is a class that is used to um, set the headers of the HTTP, HTTP request uh, to the open AI API. So this pretty much includes the content type, um, of, of the message and the authorization headers, which includes your API key. So the first part of the file, uh, we're, we're constructing a class and the constant main page uh, is an essential part of, the, of directing the users from the main chat interface um, uh, to uh, the index page. So we're pretty much telling the, the application to load the index template whenever the user uh, uh, goes to the application. And then the index method um, adorned with the, with the get mapping um, annotation um, is pretty much uh, uh, the friendly greeter for, for the user once they land to the application. And once the user access the application through the root path, uh, this method steps in and redirects the users uh, to where they're supposed to be, which is the, the chat interface. The chat method that you're seeing here uh, pretty much um, is where the magic happens. It listens to the root path for post requests um, and then it processes the incoming chat messages. Um, to do that, it relies on a model object uh, to carry the data to the view and a chat message detail object uh, to, to bring the user's message into the method. And inside the chat uh, method also, you can see uh, that we use a try catch block, which serves as a safety net, ensuring that any hiccups in the communication with the API are gracefully handled. Um, the user's message and the chat GPT response are handled, handed over then to the model. Uh, which will later present uh, uh, to the user. And in case of an exception, it delivers an error message uh, instead. Then here we've got the object mapper class. Uh, it's auto-wired as JSON mapper, uh, which is the versatile translator of our application pretty much, uh, which is capable of converting between Java objects and JSON. Uh, so here we've got also the OpenAI um, API key variable. Uh, we retrieved the OpenAI API key security from the application properties, but I hard coded it here just for the sake of this presentation. Uh, but it's recommended that you keep it in a separate file. Um, the key is, is needed to initiate the communication with, with, with OpenAI, and without it, your application won't be able to handle any request. Um, and then we've got the HTTP client class, which pretty much uh, in, is initiated as a client, and it's responsible for delivering the HTTP requests and returns their responses. Um, the, the, Constant ChatGPT URI holds the address for the ChatGPT API endpoint, ensuring that we know exactly where to send our requests. And last but not least, this is the juicy bit of the application or, or the class pretty much. It contains three main parts and I've broken it down just to make it easier for you to, to comprehend. Uh, the first part, which has our um, request body that we've uh, talked about. So here we have the model name, the prompt, the temperature, the max tokens, and you can add other uh, parameters from the ones that we discussed like top P, frequency penalty, and presence penalty. Um, and then we have the, um, the, the uh, method to construct the HTTP request pretty much using new builder. So we're specifying the URI, and we're, we're also adding two headers, one that has the content type, which is JSON, and we're also adding a header for authorization with our API key. Um, and then we're pretty much um, adding the request body, a JSON string uh, that is generated by the JSON mapper um, that is also included in the request package. Um, and just like that, we can then um, have our client send the request using the client send method. Upon receiving the message um, or the response from the model, the body is unwrapped and read into a string. Um, and then with, with parsing, uh, the object mapper um, can, can examine the JSON response and display to the user. So the first choice from the GPT's response is then extracted and polished and presented as a string. Um, there, there will always be, always be a response, but for the unlikely event, there is no response from the, uh, from the model, then we're displaying this error uh, signal, signaling that there are no responses received. So this is a simplified way of doing it, uh, including all the values 
that are needed to send a complete request to OpenAI and get a readable response from the model, but you can extend it and approach it in, di in a different way if you like uh, using different methods. And just like that, we have it ready. And this is an example of the application running. So here we're asking it a question, recommend a Java framework uh, for building a web application. You can improve the app by adding maybe a loader, but just in a few seconds, we got the response back from ChatGPT. And it recommended Spring Boot. So <laughs> this, this verifies um, what, what we just talked about. So playing with temperature, just to show you how cool the temperature uh, ch changing is, uh, if you put a temperature 0 0.1 within the same Java code and ask it to write a short poem about Java, it just acted this very um, high level basic uh, poem um, that doesn't even rhyme. But if you ask it to, to go with uh, a more creative output, for example, we use the temperature 0 0.9 here, as you can see, it went above and beyond with, with, uh, with the poem. Um, I'm not sure I agree with the ending, but yeah, it's, it's, it's quite funny and it can really have a, a different outputs that you, you don't really expect. So I'm gonna wrap it up with the future of ChatGPT and where we're gonna be seeing it heading next. So as Jacob um, has uh, discussed, the biggest upcoming update that you will start seeing soon is ChatGPT plugins. So on March uh, 23rd, I believe, um, OpenAI launched a new version of ChatGPT, uh, which can access the internet. So the new ChatGPT plugins will build upon the current uh, chatbot's capabilities. So these plugins will feed directly into the bot, giving them access to a wide range of knowledge and information uh, from third party uh, partners and excitingly the web. So pretty much here we have an example of a uh, Wolfram plugin that is being used to get the current distance between Earth and Jupiter. Um, there are multiple other plugins as well, like Expedia, Klarna, Slack, OpenTable, Shopify, and more. So imagine you can use OpenTable plugin if you're looking for a dinner reservation uh, it can suggest you a restaurant to book. Uh, if you want to use Expedia, uh, you can also uh, use it to plan a trip to Spain and have a one-click button to complete your payment online and get your tickets booked. So if Google's Bard's competitive advantage was having access to the internet, well, soon enough, it's not going to be the case anymore. Um, so this is pretty much one of the biggest advancements uh, soon uh, in ChatGPT. And if you want to talk about quickly how it's going to impact the different industries. And for the sake of time, I'm going to keep it brief. Um, ChatGPT has a potential in enhancing personal productivity to the next level. And we're already seeing it now. Uh, it's providing this virtual assistant that can help individuals manage their tasks and priorities. Um, one way it can be used, for example, to enhance personal productivity is by serving as a personal assistant, right? Um, it can schedule appointments, set reminders, and manage people's calendars. It can also provide recommendations on how to prioritize tasks and measure, manage time more effectively. Um, it could be used for project management by facilitating real-time discussions between different members within the team. It, it could help coordinate tasks, track progress, and ensure everyone is on the same page. So you can see like the different uh, possibilities of ChatGPT and the continuing possibilities with especially the plugins feature um, that ChatGPT is going to offer for, for enhancing personal productivity. For boosting business growth, there is no shortage for opportunities. Uh, it can be used for streamlining internal processes, uh, which are crucial for businesses nowadays to grow and scale. Uh, so you can help um, your business using ChatGPT to automate routine tasks, um, admi administrative work, freeing up employees and having them focused more on strategic and creative endeavors, right? Um, so from managing schedules to project collaboration uh, to drafting reports, uh, to drafting emails, uh, it can significantly reduce time and effort spent uh, on mundane tasks, um, which, which can really save a lot of time. And we've sensed this as developers, instead of spending hours on debugging, which can really be time consuming, and I believe a lot of, a lot of you can relate, you can focus now on the app logic and let ChatGPT help you with troubleshooting and debugging. Um, and, and, and for businesses, of course, it can also help with data-driven decision-making, since it has this advanced language understanding capabilities. Um, it can now be used to analyze large volumes of data, uh, enabling businesses to make more informed decisions. So it can like process data from various sources, 
um, and then look for industry trends, um, and then pretty much provide valuable insights and recommendations, uh, which helps companies make more strategic choices, uh, optimizes resources, and helps them stay ahead um, of competition. And of course, improving customer service. This is pretty much tied to the previous point because customer service is now an essential part of any business. Um, so customer service represented, uh, they're pretty much required to handle a high volume of inquiries from, from customers, uh, which can really be time consuming um, and resource intensive. So having ChatGPT to alleviate some of these challenges by providing customer service that is not just revolutionary and accurate, but it's also available 24 seven. Um, so with its natural language processing capabilities, it can really understand and respond to customer inquiries in a way that feels like a conversation with a human uh, representative. So this can help take the customer's uh, experience um, uh, to the next level and re reduces wait times and really provide more personalized responses. Um, also, ChatGPT has a potential of uh, and to revolutionize education by providing personalized and interactive learning experience. One way this could be uh, ChatGPT acting as a virtual tutor, which can uh, help students pretty much um, uh, revise certain topics or uh, receive um, in, in instant feedback and explanations on certain complex topics that really need someone to explain uh, to students. So it can help by giving feedback to assignments or help students pretty much uh, develop study plans that meets their individual learning goals. So all of these possibilities and more. Um, in addition, for instance, and I'm trying to pick your brains here by coming up with different ideas for different apps that you can utilize ChatGPT for. Um, you can facilitate real-time discussions between students. You can uh, have students pretty much brainstorm ideas with the model. Um, and we, we, we've discussed Duolingo, how it's being used now to help uh, students or, or learners pretty much have this, this conversational setting with an AI rather than just sticking to the uh, conventional way of, of learning languages. And last but not least, definitely not least, uh, ChatGPT has a potential to become an on-demand personal coach. Uh, it provides like providing tailored fitness and nutrition advice based on individual goals, preferences, limitations. It can analyze user's fitness level, medical history and lifestyle. Um, it can create customized workout plans and dietary recommendations, uh, which is pretty much evolving now. Um, and this personalized approach ensures that individuals uh, will receive this guidance um, that they need to achieve their own health and fitness objectives more effectively and at any time and with no cost associated. Um, and also, if you, if you want to think about it from a, a different aspect, it can also be helping um, people in so many ways when it comes to uh, telemedicine. So I recently worked on a project that was exploring the impact of lack of health facilities uh, and, and services in third world countries. So, and we we're exploring how technology can impact and help in this challenge. So I, with ChatGPT, you can provide this telehealth service uh, that can pretty much enhance the patient experience by serving um, a virtual intermediary between patients and healthcare providers. It can facilitate appointment scheduling, prescription management, uh, patients' follow-ups, uh, improving both the outcomes between the healthcare providers and the patients, wherever they are. And I'm going to leave you with this, something to think about. Don't just be part of the, the future, be an architect of it. Uh, so as we explore the world of AI, it's, it's essential uh, that you see yourselves as, as not just consumers of this technology, but also as, as architects and as people who are contributing to its development, shaping the way it evolves by actively participating in the AI ecosystem, uh, creating new applications, uh, collaborating with other developers, you'll be playing a vital part uh, in this innovation. And the more you engage, the more you'll help to create a future where AI serves humanity um, in ways that we, we, we still can't um, even imagine. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation about ChatGPT. We covered so many different aspects of it. Um, and I'm not sure if you have time for questions, uh, but feel free to ask anything that you have in mind.